January 1945. The poisonous maelstroms of Germany's war on the Soviet Union have changed direction, and now it is the Germans' turn to face the wrath of racial hatred in an orgy of pillage, rape, and murder at the hands of an enraged mob, the Red Army. This is episode 127 of War Against Humanity, a series of World War II in real time. I'm Spartacus Olson. When 1944 ends, it has been 42 months and a week since the German war machine poured in over the Soviet borders in Operation Barbarossa. The weeks, months, and years that followed under German and Axis occupation were a living hell for the civilian population. A hell that more may have evaded if only de facto dictator Josef Stalin had not refused to believe the warnings of an impending German invasion and allowed them to flee. What there was no warning for was the bestiality that the Nazi war machine exacted on millions of people. Plunder, forced evacuation, torture, rape, and mass murder at unprecedented scales. Now, were often comes with such horrors, but this invasion was something else. The biggest military invasion in human history was made with the explicit intent to decimate the Slavic population and to murder every single person suspect of being connected to the Nazi fantasy of a Judeo-Bolshevik conspiracy. The SS and voluntary local auxiliary units followed in their footsteps to kill every man, woman, and child judged to be Jewish. Now, the plan to decimate the Slavs was not completed for sheer practical reasons and because the Germans were stopped before they could reach Moscow. Nonetheless, they managed to starve close to three million Soviet POW to death and torture, rape, and murder millions of people. The Soviet non-Jewish civilian death toll is hard to pinpoint, but on the average estimates give that by the time the Red Army pushes the Axis forces out of the USSR, five million have died by acts of war or anti-partisan reprisals, another three to four have died of starvation and disease, and by the time this war will end, 2.2 million will have died in Nazi slave labor. The plan to exterminate the Jews has been pursued with terrifying industrial efficiency. Of the around 4.5 million Jewish Soviet citizens who in 1941 lived in the at some point occupied territory, 1.5 million managed to flee eastward, half a million were out of the Nazi hands by serving in the Red Army. The remaining 2.5 million have almost all been killed and become part of the now close to 6 million murdered in the Holocaust. While they made up less than 5% of the pre-war population, they make up close to 20% of the victims. The apocalyptic nature of the war they have waged has not escaped the German fighting men. That is why, when the Red Army now stands inside the easternmost provinces of the German Reich, soldier after soldier warns their family to expect the worst, in view of what they themselves have done to the Soviets in the past three and a half years. They are right to be afraid. But like Stalin refused to believe an invasion was imminent, German Führer Adolf Hitler dismisses it as fantasies. The Soviets simply don't have the needed power to take on Germany itself, he claims, privately, as he has let slip in the past and will soon admit. He has by now decided that within his worldview of a racial battle to the end to decide who the master race are, Germany and the Germans have not fought valiantly enough and must perish in a final racial calamity. He and the Gauleiters of the eastern provinces of the Reich, in large part annexed from Poland in 1939, Fritz Bracht in Upper Silesia, Karl Hanke in Lower Silesia, Arthur Greisa in Vaterland, Albert Forster in Danzig and West Prussia, and Erich Koch in East Prussia, are refusing to allow any evacuation of the Eastern territories. Territories that have seen a massive influx of Western German civilians fleeing Allied bombing in the past 12 months. East Prussia alone has received 800,000 refugees, so that around 12 million German civilians, infants, children, teenagers, women, and the elderly now stand in the way of the millions of men and women of the Red Army's path to Berlin. 
add to them about 12 million ethnic Poles, mostly in the Generalgouvernement, non-annexed occupied Poland, as well as a few million slave workers and allied POW and civilians taken from the USSR spread out through the territory. In total, well over 25 million mostly defenseless people are about to end up on a massive battlefield, much like in Ukraine, Belarus, and the Baltic states in 1941. There are two major differences to that situation, though. First of all, the people sympathizing with the invaders in 1941 were a minority. Here it is more than half that not only sympathize, but hope for liberation. Second of all, it was summer in 41, and now it is the deep of winter, with nighttime temperatures reaching negative 35 degrees Celsius, to not mention snow making many roads hard to navigate and the landscape mostly impenetrable, especially on foot. Escape by boat would be possible, but on the coast in West and East Prussia, in the cities of Königsberg and Danzig, Großadmiral Karl Dönitz, head of the Kriegsmarine, is actively supporting Hitler's last stand. This past November, he ordered all ships, even some marines in the Baltic Sea, to only transport troops, fuel, and ammunition to supply the defenders in what the Nazis hope will be a pocket of indomitable resistance in the East. His orders explicitly mention that under no circumstances shall they begin any civilian evacuations over the Baltic. As January comes around and the desire to flee grows, Dönitz still stands by his orders. Already the precursors to the Soviet offensive indicate what is to come when back in October, forward Red Army troops made incursions into East Prussia and went on a rape, pillage and murder spree in Niemelsdorf, leaving some 74 German civilians and 50 Belgian and French POW dead. In the past months, Reich's Propaganda Minister Josef Goebbels has made sure that the Niemelsdorf massacre has been publicized across the Reich in an effort to whip up a will to resist. The result has rather been a desire to escape, at least among women and children. From the men's perspective of all ages, the story is somewhat different. Hitler has ordered the Volkssturm, the people's storm, the conscription of all able-bodied, even not so able-bodied, German men between 16 and 60. In effect, that has already meant boys younger and older than that being put together in makeshift battalions, lacking not only experience, but also uniforms, weapons, and ammunition. Most are older or invalid men, infirm war veterans, leading to the widespread joke. Why is the Volkssturm Germany's most precious resource? Because its members have silver in their hair, gold in their mouths, and lead in their bones. Now, theoretically, this could generate a force of 13.5 million. That's not practical, and some are needed for other war-related work. So the goal the Gauleiters are given is to raise an army of 6 million, which they do. But there are not anywhere close to enough weaponry and ammunition to arm them. Although Albert Speer's slave-based industrial miracle has meant that Germany is putting out arms and ammunition at a higher rate than at any other time of the war, despite Allied bombing, Speer cannot fix the real problems facing Germany. Attrition, logistics, and since November, a lack of fuel. At this point, the losses on the ground are so massive that it is impossible for the industry to keep up, bombs or no bombs. The fronts have been moving so much and keep changing to the point of a logistical nightmare so that even the produced armaments don't reach where they're the most needed. In the field, already back in October, the Wehrmacht was short of 714,000 guns to operate fully armed. To arm the Volkssturm, they managed to scrounge together only 40,500 guns and 2,900 machine guns by end of January 45. It's a hodgepodge of foreign and out-of-date arms with a variety of incompatible ammunition and no replacement parts. So only less than one out of a hundred Volkssturm soldiers will have a gun going into battle. The other 99.5% will either operate machine guns dismounted from airframes, flak guns repurposed as artillery, a limited supply of grenades and panzerfaust, or have to seize a gun from the fallen on the battlefield. During the autumn, the young recruits are sent to boot camp with the idea that they will eventually become regular soldiers. The older men are given 10 to 14 days of training and then deployed. 
Reichsführer SS Heinrich Hemmler is given overall command of this new army that is organized in small battalions that will either set up defenses across the land or fight in cohort with the regular forces. As the year 1944 ends, that is an idea that fits poorly to the in reality confused state of German command on the field. In combination with Hitler's hold fast orders, it leaves the Volkssturm battalions as little more than cannon fodder waiting for the inevitable onslaught of the Red Army. In mid-January, Speer promises a speedy improvement. He presents his incredibly high in armament production numbers from the fourth quarter of 1944 and predicts an even higher output in this first quarter of 45. Like he is enthusiastic about the supplies, the Gauleiters are enthusiastic about their new roles as commanders of a civilian defense and parade around their towns and cities, giving fanatical speeches meant to rally the spirits. It's part of a propaganda machine that extends into both the Wehrmacht and the Volkssturm through the function of the National Socialist Leadership Officers improvised in 1943. By end of 1944, that force has swelled to 47,000 and is by a long shot not an organization manned solely by Nazi party members, but a vast array who, like so many other Germans of the time, share the Nazis' believe in a racial culture war and anti-Semitic conspiracy mythology. Some have even rejected the Nazis politically, but are now on board for a last fight, like high school teacher August Topavin, who writes, The clearer it becomes that Hitler is not the god to whom people have prayed, the more I feel bound to him. His rejection of Nazism has been based on that he is a Catholic, but he does share the central belief in the fantasy of a Jewish cabal out to control the world, and his main stated goal is to stop another 1918 revolution at any cost. These beliefs, and the fear of a vengeful Red Army, is documented again and again in the letters of Volkssturm men when they claim high motivation to resist. The conscription of the male youth and elderly has meant unmanning the air defenses across the Reich. These are now manned by 10,000 women, mainly young women, some as young as 14. This conscription of children and the fairer sex goes straight against the incessant repetition of Nazi propaganda that the reason the men have to fight is to protect the children and the women from the inevitable racial attack they fantasize about. In his radio address last autumn that launched the Volkssturm, Hitler brushed that aside by reminding the nation of his doomsday prophecy that the enemy's final goal is to exterminate the German people, and that it is better that a young cohort dies and the nation is saved than that I spare a young cohort and a whole nation of 80 to 90 million people dies out. Like the Volkssturm has been in preparation since end of last summer, so has a race to fortify cities and create defensive lines along the expected front lines. In the West, 200,000 men and women reinforce the Westwall from August to November. Portions of this are already being overrun. In September, 137 units of Hitler Youth and Reich Labor Service were put to work digging trenches and reinforcing walls along the borders of the Reich. In the East, 500,000 Germans and slaves were conscripted to create what the Nazis think will become an impenetrable network of defenses. By the first week of January, the number of workers in the East alone has risen to 1.5 million. There, 20 towns and cities have been declared fortress cities to defend to the last drop of blood, mainly the blood of the Volkssturm and the lockdown civilians. As 1944 ends, that bloodletting has still not begun in earnest. Yes, many cities are in part in ruins and the holiday season in Germany is anything but a feast of joy. Still, in Berlin and many other cities and towns, the trams are still running. Despite spending night after night in shelters during the ever-increasing bomb raids, on most days, people who haven't evacuated or been conscripted go to work as usual. Theaters are closed because of the entertainment industry war work decree from October, but the cinemas are still operating. There's no dancing, but many restaurants are still serving, albeit with far less than usual on the menu, and stores are still selling the limited supply of rationed goods they are allowed. In the countryside, if it wasn't for the abundance of slave workers and refugees and the conspicuous lack of local men of fighting age, it would be a winter like any winter. 
And so it is that as the clocks tick over from 1944 to 1945, when the war their nation began has raged ferociously across Europe, Africa, and the Middle East for 63 months, most of the German Reich and most Germans, even in its furthest eastern outposts, even after the massive Allied bomb raids on German cities and towns, have yet to experience the war firsthand. On the 13th of January 1945, that long reprieve is over when the juggernaut of the Red Army roars into and through the defensive lines of the Wehrmacht in the eastern provinces. And he is giving you a detailed blow-by-blow -blow account of the initial fighting between the armies, and as he hinted in his episode from that week, in the wake of the invasion comes a tsunami of violence and destruction exacted by the Red Army men. Now, Regardless of the Nazis' attempt to hold back their population to become part of a bloody bulwark to protect the German heartlands, millions try to flee westward. Trains are rarely an option. You need special dispensation to get a ticket, and at least at first, Dönitz's orders stand and escape by boat is impossible. Instead, the refugees take to the snow and ice-covered roads, where many of them will die from exposure. In Königsberg, quickly cut off from the rest of the Reich, people try to flee west across the Bay of Danzig on the few hundred meter wide and 70 kilometer long land tongue, the Frische Nährung. Here, the ice helps as the Frische Haf, the sea between the mainland and the land tongue, is frozen over. Still, it is the single road that runs along the Nährung that is the only truly navigable path. Within days, a refugee column stretching from Königsberg to Danzig forms. They face the cold, the wind, snow, aerial attacks, and their own military, who constantly have to move them off the roads as they try to use the same path to move ordnance, weaponry and men in the opposite direction from Danzig to Königsberg. By the second half of January, some three million, perhaps more, are fleeing. Long columns of freezing families and the elderly soon tread along the paths lined by the dead, frozen bodies that soon litter the roads from East Prussia westward through occupied Poland and the other Eastern Reich provinces into the heartlands of the Reich. By January 29th, four million people have left their homes and more and more do every day. Dönitz's orders now create a tragedy. Despite the ban on taking civilians, refugees flock to the docks in Königsberg and try to get on boats leaving with wounded soldiers after delivering supplies and weaponry. By January 21st, it is clear that the situation is untenable, and Dönitz allows Admiral Hans-Georg von Freideburg to start Operation Hannibal. Ships and U-boats are now allowed to transport fleeing civilians. Now, these are still regular Kriegsmarine ships, not even transports with wounded are actual hospital ships, and therefore they are not marked as such and remain viable targets for the enemy. Accordingly, they come under attack from the Red Navy and Red Air Force. Thousands of civilians go down together with soldiers being rescued or relocated. The worst disaster is when a Soviet submarine sinks the ocean liner turned troop transport Wilhelm Gustloff on January 31st. Exact number of people on board is unclear. The official count is 7,956, but as the count concluded and boarding was halted, up to 2,500 civilians stormed over the gangplanks, so it could be as many as 8,800 civilians and 1,500 Wehrmacht personnel for a total of 10,300. Out of them, only 1,239 are saved from the icy waters. The rest go down with the ship, making it the worst maritime disaster involving a single ship in known history. Still, Operation Hannibal will manage to transport some 2.5 million people to safety in the next weeks and months. Who are not safe are the recruits of the Volkssturm. In the utter chaos created by the fast advance by the Red Army and the ever-changing and conflicting orders from Hitler, Himmler, and the other demagogues, they have nothing to put up against the by now well-equipped and, albeit unruly, well-organized Red Army. Young boys enthusiastically and old men reluctantly throw themselves into battle only to be mowed down, murdered, or captured. Many of the men who raised this mass of cannon fodder, the Gauleiters, are less than keen to meet the same fate. Otto Greisa flees Poznan on January 20th without lifting the order to hold the city to the last drop of German blood.
Erich Koch does the same in Königsberg two days later and Fritz Bracht in Upper Silesia on the 24th. Behind them, the Red Army soldiers are enacting a mayhem of gargantuan proportions. The soldiers murder liberally anyone they perceive as a Nazi or Nazi helper, or for that matter, simply German. Torture and gruesome forms of murder is widespread. In the homesteads they cross, they plunder, vandalize, and burn. By their own accounts, often they bust things up just for the sake of making sure some officer doesn't get it after they leave. Women and girls are the most frequent praise of this rage. The soldiers seize girls as young as eight and women as old as 80 and violently subjugate them to single rapes, group rapes, and prolonged sexual slavery. It's by no means an accidental act of the forces spontaneously stepping outside their bounds and running amok against orders. Sure, formally they have been told to behave, and through January and February some higher officers, appalled by the horror and lack of discipline, even Stavka, issue orders of restraint, and some lower officers do hold their men in check. Mostly these orders are ignored without consequence. You see, the mayhem the vast majority exacts on the population and their dwellings has been in preparation for months or even years. With sanction, or at least acceptance from Moscow, propagandists like Ilya Iremorg, with a standing column in Krasnaya Zvezda, the Red Army newspaper, have been and are dehumanizing the Germans and heating up a murderous fever in article after article. Kill the Germans wherever you find them. Every German is our moral enemy. Have no mercy on women, children, or the aged. Kill every German. Wipe them out. When the invasion is about to begin, Ehrenburg muses that any German woman is fair prey, or as he puts it, that blonde hag is in for a bad time. Add to that that the Red Army, with Stalin's explicit approval, and despite the inclusion of women in the fighting forces, has been fostering a conscious policy of sexual subjugation of women and acceptance of rape through the semi-officially sanctioned and by the leadership publicly supported practice of the men holding female soldiers or supporting personnel as front wives. At best, a form of coerced sexual bondage, at worst, institutionalized and systematic rape. Contradicting any orders to not loot as the Red Army enters Germany, weight restrictions on packages sent home are increased from one kilo to five kilos. Thus, perhaps expectedly, enforcement of the fig leaf orders to not pillage, rape, and murder are hardly enforced at all. But while participation in this frenzy of violence is widespread, even involving most soldiers, it is by far not all of them. The experience of barely 15-year-old Leone Bialas in Breslau is telling. Her first confrontation with the Red Army is an officer in the forward troops who tells her, you have nothing to fear from us, but when the other troops come, you are beyond help. We have four years of war behind us, and there has hardly been any leave. The men have been promised German women as victory trophies. That has increased their fighting morale. Only days later, a Red Army soldier steals her innocence when he rapes her in the family bathroom. And then for weeks, Leonie, her mother, and her 60-year-old aunt are raped repeatedly by an unstoppable stream of Red Army men. They survive the ordeal, or at least their bodies do, but not all do. Many women die from the wounds inflicted by mass rape. Others are killed in sadistic lust, and some kill themselves in desperation and shame. Group rapes are frequent, with soldiers literally lining up to have a go at a single woman, sometimes dozens at a time. Mothers are raped in front of their little children, daughters in front of their mothers, fathers, and siblings. Men and boys are raped as well, although at a far lower frequency. The entire territory that the Red Army is taking is like a raper's paradise. Millions of displaced women without anything or anyone in a state to protect them. The words, Frau, commit, woman, Come with me, barked in heavy eastern accents, becomes the terrifying signal that it is about to happen. In a church in Lichtenhagen on the outskirts of Königsberg, the Red Army soldiers supply themselves out of the many refugees seeking shelter there. Everywhere you could see scurrying figures, flashlights flashed. Woman, come with me! It sounded again and again. Women were forcibly dragged out of the benches and taken into the dark to the choir or the bell tower, and everything played ghostly quietly. No one dared to scream loudly. 
we hardly dared to whisper to draw attention to us. The horrors sneaked through the church on silent souls. Again and again, I heard a harsh, Come with me! Faced with the inevitable, women turn on each other to deliver someone else into the hands of the soldiers. On January 27th, 15-year-old Gabi Köp and her sister are put on a train leaving Posen for Hamburg by their mother. Because of fighting, the train is rerouted and ends up stranded at a small rural station when the rails forward are cut off by the Red Army advance. Gabi and her sister get separated as they try to continue their flight on foot. In an area already occupied by the Red Army, Gabi finds shelter with a group of other refugees. There she becomes the shield used by other women to escape rape when soldiers enter the shelter demanding a woman. The women are shivering in fear that it could now be their turn. I literally feel without seeing that they are looking for me. Let the women go themselves when they are so afraid of being shot. But already Mrs. W asks, Where is little Gabi? I hear it once again. She doesn't give me any rest until she has pulled me out from under the table. I think bitterly. You can do it with me. I'm alone and I don't have anyone to stand up for me. When the soldier has satisfied his lust with the teenager, he returns her to the shelter, and then it all starts again. For two weeks, several times per day, Gabi is delivered into the hands of the rapists. The soldiers might justify their acts as revenge, but that attempt at an explanation for their actions becomes hard to believe in view of the rape of hundreds of thousands of ethnic Polish women. Soviet women enslaved by the Nazis and now liberated by their countrymen only to become their sex slaves, and even women rescued from the death marches and camp system. Twelve-year-old Jewish-Hungarian Judith Rosna, deported to Ravensbrück this past November, will be rescued from the death marches in April, only to find herself to be the potential victim of her liberators she will remember. To us it was another terrible thing uh, that's going to happen, because now we had to protect ourselves from the Russians. They came like wild beasts, and they didn't know who we were exactly, and the women were scared of them. When we stayed in a little apartment, we went to sleep with all the furniture by the door, so they cannot come in at night. Judith escapes being raped, but during the Red Army advance towards Berlin, an estimated 1.5 million women will not, and then the occupation will begin and their ordeal will not end. How many of the more than 2 million civilians who have already or will die during the Red Army's advance in coming months are victims of rape and murder, freeze to death, succumb to starvation, or die in the fighting is unclear. You reap what you sow, the saying goes. But that isn't what's happening here, is it? Leone and Gabi were three-year-old babies when the Nazis were carried to power by a complacent or supportive German population. They were little children still when Germany began this war. Judith and the hundreds of thousands of Polish women who fall victim to the Red Army were themselves victims of the poisonous seeds sown by the Nazis. None of them have planted any seeds. None of them have been the farmers of hatred. This is not revenge or payback or even collective retribution. This is the chaotic rage, violence, and satisfaction of sadistic lusts born of the egocentric seed that we all carry within us and sprouts into a harvest of terror when the moral standards and rules that make us human are lifted, or, as in this case, perverted by ideology. Never forget. Thank you.